Oh, you're new here? Let's help customers, while we talk about my PP, and your wee wee. Warning, these revenge stories, might be upsetting to entitled managers. You found the best place for your vengeful needs. Team Builder took a fractured team, and brought them together to achieve a common goal. Unfiltered revenge. Working for this Karen, could be your kiss of death. But being too passionate, she talked her way out of a severance package. Creepy, golem looking employee, climbs the corporate ladder by stacking complaints. But when he calls for his precious, he forgot how vengeful it could be. When the like button starts talking to you, interrupt it, by telling it, to firstly brush its teeth. A few years ago, I was sitting in a job interview and the hiring manager asked, What do you consider the greatest accomplishment of your career? This gave me a pause, as I've been doing the same thing for over 25 years. I let the mists of memory, transport me back in time. I started on the unit as an already seasoned nurse, and soon discovered that most of the staff who worked there, were very young and inexperienced. For many, this was their first real job. They assumed all the weird stuff that happened every day, was just normal for the workplace. Dorian, the nurse manager, had decreed that no one was allowed to write incident reports for medical errors or safety issues, because it makes him look bad in safety huddle. Non-clinical staff allowed to pass meds and schedule changes without notice. Additionally, the department was easily the most toxic I've ever worked in, with various cliques at constant war with one another. I could go on and on. The troubles began one day, when I opened my email to a message from Dorian which stated very curtly, that I was being investigated for an incident which had happened on the unit, and that I was to meet with HR to discuss it, and for possibly disciplinary action. I was not to discuss the incident with anyone. No date was given, no medical record number, no indication what the issue could be. I replied that I would need the above information, would speak with my union rep, and meet at a time convenient for me. Dorian declined to give information, I declined to meet with him. I began receiving emails almost daily, each more threatening than the last. I printed them all. Contacted my sister, the employment attorney. Tried not to start shaking whenever I had to check my email. I was keenly aware, that this is intimidation 101, but it is remarkably effective even when you know that. Because I'm not a direction follower, I was soon discussing this in the break room and before I knew it, had been, approached by three other women, who had all received the same email on the same day. Comparison showed the emails being sent about a minute apart. We did not work the same shifts nor the same days. We agreed to call in the union rep and refused to meet with HR. Dorian continued to escalate, including cornering us in the hall. He's a very big guy. So when he would see us, he would approach and step in our personal zone, chest to chest and trying to stare us down. Before long, we were speaking to more and more women, and it came to light that Dorian had a habit of targeting them with this exact email. This was followed by others that were more and more threatening, until the person would finally meet with HR, get written up for something vague, and then be forced to sign a non-disclosure slash no retaliation agreement. It seemed that he had simply picked the wrong four women this time, because we were not having it. I can't tell you how much time at work began to be spent with people crying while recounting their stories. None had thought to call in the union rep. They did not even know their vine garden rights. But we did have another thought, which was vengeful. So as you can guess, we began to plot. We had limited time, and our company has a long and unglamorous history of protecting people like this. Before long, the entire team was united against the common enemy. LGBTQ staff wrote up statements, backed with witnesses, of grossly hateful comments, often in the presence of patients. Staff who were immigrants, made statements about racial slurs. A staff member, who was incredibly petty and vindictive, had been compiling a dossier on every perceived policy violation and wrongdoing on Dorian's part, since his hiring date, and he even prepped it for a presentation to HR. The graveyard shift, consisting out of the other huge men, said, Obviously, Dorian isn't trying to flex on you all. But sure, we want to help. So they spent a couple nights cruising. Dorian's social media posts and capturing screenshots of hateful anti-trans, xenophobic, and misogynistic content. Worried that they hadn't done enough, the night staff paid for a cheap background check. But nobody expected the result would be so damning, because it was a huge score. DUI, failure to appear, hit and run, domestic violence, assault with a deadly weapon. Made me think, 
Did the company not do a background check? Like how is this possible? Finally, two women came forward with complaints of harassment. One incident had even occurred in the presence of the assistant manager, and one was documented in an email. We were ready. We flooded HR with meeting requests and our union rep coordinated the assault so that on Monday, we met for simple harassment and intimidation. I met first and HR seemed unimpressed by my complaint. Tuesday, all LGBTQ and staff subjected to racial slurs, made their formal complaints. They said that the HR lady looked tired. Wednesday started with a background check, moved into the minutia of policy violation, and culminated with well-documented quid pro quo harassment. The union rep informed HR, that the union's attorney was eager to know how to proceed. HR assured her that would not be necessary. That evening, Dorian posted a sign on his office door, saying he would be away for a few days and to contact the program manager Dr. Steve or the clinical director Dr. Kip, if we needed anything. Graveyard Shift reported, that over the weekend housekeeping came and removed everything from his office, except his name tag, which the night staff took as a trophy. On Monday at Shift Change, the CNO, COO, and HR met with the team and informed us that effective immediately, Dorian was no longer employed by the hospital. We all sat silently and politely until they exited the unit, when a loud and spontaneous cheer went up. People were hugging each other and cry laughing. High fives all around. Aftermath, to the best of my knowledge, Dorian never worked as a nurse again. Frankly I don't care. Kip was fired three days later for having been aware of all that was going on and turning a blind eye, and because apparently he'd been harassing women on the unit for a couple years. I hadn't been aware of that, but it came out in the HR meetings. Dr. Steve was also fired for the same reason. But this revenge didn't just expose these bad men. Unfortunately for us, they only made room for something even worse. The unit hired an old manager of mine who had a long and well-documented history of, you guessed it, harassment. I quit within days of him being offered the job. The department's foray into getting along crumbled. Most of the staff have moved on to other jobs where they seem much happier. What do you consider the greatest accomplishment of your career? I sat up straight, smiled, and said. I took a very fractured team, and brought them together to achieve a common goal. I like to think I'm really good at team building. I hope you warned everyone about your old manager, before you left. I actually warned them before they hired him, but the big bosses felt like being let go from his last three jobs for harassment, wasn't a deal breaker. I just couldn't keep working there after that team of professionals working together part-time, using their own money and lawyers to document, provide witness testimony, prove and insist mistreatment occurred. Despite already documented public records, gets abusive man removed and it took, I'm guessing, months to work. Then they replace him with yet another documented offender. This is with a union. They don't give a flying frickle about labor folks. They don't. They want you to sacrifice your youth your health, relationships, and your sanity so that you can work until you're too old to be useful to the company. When they can cast you aside for someone younger and at the bottom of the pay scale. Your story made me think of my greatest revenge achievement. I worked for a manager who was overbearing, vindictive, played favorites and had zero appreciation of my engineering skills and experience. He put me on menial tasks and I realized that my career progression with him would be zero. I left for another company where my skills were appreciated and my job flourished. I was promoted to a senior role two layers below the boss, although that distinction was a bit meaningless, as you were treated according to your expertise, not your grade. That is the sort of culture it was. Then one day, I spotted my old toxic boss in a closed door meeting with my new boss. I asked around, to be told he was being considered for a senior management role. I went to my boss and told him that if he was hired, I would not work with him, and if there was even a hint I would be working for him, I would resign that day. He seemed shocked, as I never had a problem working for anyone else and asked a few questions about my experience working for him. I never saw my old, toxic boss, ever again. Oh, I'll bet that felt amazing. This is a burner account. Names and places have been changed to protect the innocent and of course, the not so innocent. Some years ago, I started working for a heavy industrial manufacturing company. I lucked out and got a great supervisor for a boss, named Joe. 
The work was hard, working 12 hour days for 13 days in a row and then a Sunday off, then back for another 13 days. I was young and didn't mind, it helped my wife and I saved up for a house. After about six months, Joe noticed I was picking up on the work pretty fast and promoted me to a group leader position. This came with a raise and increased responsibility that most other workers didn't want. Joe would put me in troubled groups in his department, and I would work on general improvements and figuring out the issues. This was a union shop and the mentality was to just put in your hours, don't work harder or smarter, just do your time and don't kill the job, was the unspoken motto. After a few years, Joe was promoted to a manager role and he transferred me with him to his departments. While I wasn't a supervisor yet, I was the supervisor in all but name. The supervisors loved it, because they never had to leave the office and I liked it, because it was a good learning experience. I made a good reputation and got a lot of respect from workers and from management. Eventually, Joe's areas were doing so well, he was promoted to plant manager. As before he wanted to promote me with him, this time to a supervisor spot. We talked in length, because the only supervisor spot open was working for Karen. Karen was female, a minority, and a member of the LGBTQ community. She was the poster child on the company website of the inclusiveness in the workplace, literally her face was the one they used. She was also a freshly minted manager, and Joe was not confident in her abilities. But me being the plucky go-getter with a can-do attitude, decided to take the position. I had an interview with Karen and got to meet some of her supervisors, they were very quiet and reserved. Once I was promoted I worked in tandem with another supervisor, Chris. Chris was young, had one small child and his wife was pregnant and a stay-at-home mom. During the first week everything was going well, I was learning all the employees, getting to know the process, and getting my feeling for the area. During the second week, Chris's wife went into labor and she had a hard time. Chris went on paternity leave for six weeks and I was tossed into the deep end in charge of the whole area solo, with 60 employees. I was barely treading water, but I was doing my best. When I would ask Karen for guidance or assistance, she would scoff like it was beneath her and tell me, If I have to do your job, then I don't need you. So I gritted my teeth and worked my tail off. My wife got me a smart watch and I was averaging 25,000 steps a day, trying to keep everything running. We were holding our own and employees all did what they could to help, as the situation was not ideal for everyone. A few weeks and I was reviewing some quality documents, and I noticed that one of the quality gates was not being followed. I emailed the info to the quality engineers, and they lost their minds. This was a 4-hour operation on a 20-hour part that we were skipping entirely. Turns out, one of the reasons Karen got promoted, was because she was running her department so efficiently. Then it came to light that she made the decision to skip this quality process, saving that 20% of time. Except the engineers never signed off on this and it caused massive damage control. The process had to be reinstated and the parts that were never checked, had to have warranty extensions. This caused the company to have egg on their face and Karen to look bad. During this time, Karen also became more vindictive, she would openly tell people she would never be fired and could do what she wanted. She, would walk the departments and if she didn't like someone, she would make the supervisors write them up by the end of the day. She wanted us to find a reason and if we didn't, she would take it out on the supervisors. For example, forcing the supervisors to stay late to do inventory or something else menial, just because she could. She would not let the supervisors make any decisions until she approved, so something like overtime had to wait for her approval and she would not respond until the end of the day, causing the departments to scramble. Then, if there weren't enough overtime employees to do the work, she would blame it on the supervisors. While the supervisors knew this wasn't right, we all needed our job and tried to do the best we could for Karen and the employees. We were mainly rodeo clowns, to Karen being the bull. The first day Chris was back, him and I were both pulled into Karen's office. She started berating me on how poor of a job I was doing, making her look bad, and how I never came to her for help. This made me speechless, because of the previous comments she made and the fact that supervisor work was beneath her. After the meeting I was still a bit stunned, but I put it together. She was about to railroad me out of the company and this was the first step. I called Joe and asked for a meeting that same day. When I got together with Joe, I started telling him about the things that were going on that he had no idea about the harassment, the abuse, the vindictive nature. Ironically while I was speaking with him, another supervisor called him to complain about Karen as well with the same grievances. Joe was stunned, and said he would speak with Karen but he gave me carte blanche on any open spot in the company, starting next day. He really didn't want to lose me. 
I did a lateral transfer to a different department doing engineering slash IT work, and I thought that was the end of it. A few weeks later I was leaving, work and Karen mentioned that I never turned in my laptop and phone to her, I told her I didn't know I had two, but that I could give it to her tomorrow. She smirked and said, I'll get it back, soon enough. I didn't think too much of it at the time. After about six months I had my review with my new boss Jake. The review went great as he was very happy with my work, and was a bit surprised at how fast I picked up things. At the end of the meeting, Jake mentioned offhand how Karen tried to intervene in the review and get me fired. But Joe stepped in and squashed it. Okay Karen. Now you pissed me off. After I left Karen's department, the turnover rate went through the roof, the supervisors were quitting at a rate of one every three months. Keep in mind, that this is a legacy company that had multi-generations working, fathers, mothers, sons, entire families. Some areas had three generations working side by side, and yet Karen was rolling over employees and supervisors like a steamroller. Working for her, became the kiss of death. I casually mentioned to Joe about the turnover and he told me he couldn't figure out what was going on, as people were quitting without notice and no one was doing exit interviews. I told Joe that Karen was writing people up to force them out, when they would hand her the resignation letter or two weeks notice, she would tell them to leave immediately and throw away the letter. Then she would tell HR that the person quit on the spot, and that was the end of it. Joe told me that because of who she was and how high she was, the company wouldn't do anything to her until they had an airtight case. So, I went to work. I took the supervisors working for Karen out drinking after work a few times a week, and made sure I had my hand on the pulse. If someone was quitting, I made sure they emailed their letter of resignation to Karen and CCD Joe and HR, stayed for their exit interview and that they called the company integrity hotline, for good measure. Things were progressing well, and I had all the supervisors on board except Chris. Chris really needed the job, and Karen was not writing him up. Through a stroke of luck I found out, Karen was low-balling his raises as a cost-saving measure, that's why she was not harassing him. When I told Chris, he was furious and wanted to quit on the spot. I encouraged him to speak with Joe before he leaves. Joe and Chris had a very productive meeting, and Chris decided to stay. Now all the supervisors were on board. Joe brought in an HR bigwig from the headquarters in Kansas and over the course of a week, each supervisor was sent in for an interview discreetly, without Karen knowing. By the time the interviews were over they had emails, texts, eyewitnesses and a mountain of evidence. This next part I heard from other people, HR, Joe, etc. Despite everything, the company wanted to keep this quiet. So they brought in Karen and said they no longer needed her, and offered a very generous severance package. Karen being Karen, lost it on the HR people, she threatened to sue for discrimination, and even called a lawyer. That's when the company pulled out the stack of evidence, and rescinded the severance offer. After a few months, Karen found a new job as a plant manager in a different factory. And I found out where. I casually mentioned to the union reps at my factory where Karen was working and suggested that maybe they should give the union at the other factory a call. She was fired within three months for employee harassment. Last I heard, she had to sell her house and move out of state to find a job. Karen's hissy fit costing her the severance package is just the cherry on top of this delicious revenge sundae. Big props to Joe as well for his role, it would have been a lot harder to give Karen her just desserts without his help. Everything up to the last two sentences I would consider pro-revenge, but calling her next place of work and that leading to her getting fired there too? Definitely nuclear. Good work. This is delicious revenge, especially the part when Karen talked her way out of a severance package. The following story is told from a female perspective. I used to work for a very popular pub chain in the United Kingdom, which is loosely named after a kitchen utensil. I was there for three years and considered one of their best employees. I was never late, rarely called in sick and went above and beyond my payroll. I'm stating all this to show that I was a very well-trusted employee. I've even been told that by some of the managers. I never really had any issues with them, apart from the top manager, who we shall call Heather. Heather was friends with a co-worker of mine, who we will call Gollum, because he kinda looked like Gollum. Gollum was the same as me, a general team member, whilst Heather was the head manager. Because of their friendship, Gollum got away with a lot. Talking to customers rudely, being on his phone at work, swearing, 
putting his headphones in and listening to music on shift, snapping at co-workers, etc. And the main thing, being a creepy piece of crap, that didn't respect personal boundaries. When I first started there, Gollum was assigned to be my buddy to help me ease into things. I was a transfer, so I already knew what to do, I just needed to learn the pub slash bar layout. Within 5 minutes of me starting, Gollum began talking to me about sexy time positions, water spraying, if you know what I mean, and a load of other inappropriate stuff. And he's saying all this. In front of customers. It was a quiet day in a quiet pub, and people's voices echo. Yes, I was 18 plus at the time, so at least there's that. Luckily, the only women that he wasn't weird to, were the minors. But that's the only thing that I can cross off a very long list. Anyway, during my first year, I made it clear that Gollum just wasn't my type. I also learned that he's like this, with literally every other female member of staff. There were even a few instances where he was creepy to customers. Flirting with them, trying to chat them up, and continuing, when they were clearly uncomfortable. He once wolf whistled after a woman when she was leaving the pub, which earned him a complaint. Myself, customers, and practically every other female member of staff had complained about him, at least once. But the reason he kept getting away with it, is because he's besties with Heather. The other managers would actually tell him off, and try to step in, but there's only so much they can do as they don't have all the power that Heather has. This went on for the first two years that I was there, until I hit a breaking point. When the lockdown happened, we were one of the first places to reopen. I overheard that one of our minor employees has turned 18, and she had received a creepy comment off Gollum. It wasn't said directly to her, but that doesn't make it any better. It was something along the lines of, Oh, so she turned 18 over lockdown? Damn, I always thought she was kinda hot. Yikes. And to make things even worse, Heather promoted Gollum. She allowed him to step up the ladder, the ladder which was a stack of all his complaints. Gollum's behavior became even worse, and I couldn't tolerate it any longer. I was determined to make things happen. When I went home after that shift, I set up a new email account under an anonymous name. I found the email for our head office, and I began writing out a report. I also contacted a few female co-workers that I could trust to keep things private, and they told me all their personal creepy encounters with Gollum. By the time I had finished this report, it was around 2000 words full of some of the few inappropriate encounters that both staff and customers had to deal with, and how Heather was keeping Gollum safe, by not acting on reports, etc. I made sure to reiterate that I wanted my report to be anonymous, as I was scared that Heather would take things out on me personally, as I have seen her do similar things before. How she was a manager was beyond me. Within a few days, I received an email back. They reiterated that I will be kept anonymous, but I need to do an interview to begin the investigation. I agreed, and we scheduled a meeting. During our meeting, I went over everything in my report, and they told me the steps they were going to take. The head office team were lovely, actually. I felt like I was finally being listened to. Gollum was automatically suspended, pending investigation. Head office selected 12 members of staff at random, both male and female, and interviewed all of them. They only interviewed six members of staff before deciding enough was enough. Gollum was a creep, and they had more than enough reason to fire him. So, Gollum was fired, and was banned from stepping foot on the premises, and I think the premises of any other one of their pubs, but I'm not sure of that. Heather was also put under investigation, and I don't know how she managed this, but she bluffed her way out. They let her off with a warning, and they recently promoted her. But I was out to get Gollum, Heather was just a bonus, one that I sadly didn't get. I remained anonymous, thankfully. Heather still has no idea who reported Gollum and herself. A few months later, I left after clashing heads with Heather one too many times. I couldn't stand her anymore, so I quit. I've been free from that job for a year now, and since then, I've heard through friends and mutuals that Gollum was struggling to find work, due to his record. I'm not sure how it all works, if he's listed as an official creep, or whatever, but he was struggling either way. He clearly hit a breaking point of being unemployed, and has decided to move out of the city. He had a leaving party a few months ago, and now, our city is free from Gollum. To be honest, I hope he finds his way into the fiery pits of Mordor, but even if he doesn't, at least he's gone. So there's my story, about how I managed to shoo away a predatorial creep, both, from my former workplace, and my city. You stayed till the end, which means you're the one I make these episodes for. 
Thank you for your support, I really appreciate you. Subscribe, so you don't miss out on future episodes and show your vengeful devotion, by tickling the like button without mercy. Do you have any experiences surrounding the topic of this episode? Share yours below, I'll join the conversation. I'll be seeing you, in the next one. Remember that these stories are shared for your entertainment. This content is to be taken as such, and nothing else. Royal AI, rejects advocation or instigation of illegal actions.